All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joshua Turton. I'm with Phase 2. Today is how, when, and why to patch a module. We're going to be covering one of the fundamental Drupal skills, uh, in my opinion, that you need to, knew, to know how to do in order to both work with and work within the Drupal community. So let's get started with a, a, a very basic question. What is a patch? When you're working on a code platform like Drupal, there may come a time when you need to change some code that you didn't write or that you don't control. Patches are how we do that. They're a universal standard in the software world. Not just in the web world. Video games, enterprise business applications, and operating systems all use patches to make changes on the fly. At their heart, patches are small files that contain a list of the changes you wish to make between the existing code and the code the way you want it to run. They are applied to the existing code and make permanent changes to that code. This is an example of a very small patch file. Let's take a closer look. The most important lines are the ones that are highlighted here. The plus and minus signs on the left tell us these lines are the ones that are changing. Minus is a line that's being removed. Plus is a line that's being added in its place. On the right, with the, where the arrow's highlighting, you can see the actual changes to the text that generated the change, or that triggered the change. Well, when and why would we do this? In the Drupal community, we don't hack core. And we really shouldn't hack contrib either. There are two main reasons. Forward compatibility. If a feature, if a, if a new feature or change, or most importantly, a security release, comes out for a module that you've tinkered with, you can't take advantage of that without losing your changes. The second reason is developer friendliness. If your changes introduce a bug down the road, other developers are not going to look in that module because they're going to assume you didn't mess with it. This will cost them time and frustration. Don't do it. But sometimes we need to. Sometimes you just you need to make that change. That's where patches come in. They're a way to modify core contrib code in a way that's maintainable, that's future friendly, and that's reproducible. And it will save the kittens. So what's the difference? What is the difference between a patch and a hack? Fundamentally, the difference is method. When I say hack a module, it means I'm changing module code directly. Then I'm either uploading it straight into my site repo, or worse, onto the production server and running it as it is. It's the cowboy way of coding. Okay? Changes like this are really pretty invisible to other developers because there's nothing there to tell them that anything changed. When I say patch a module, it means the changes that I've made are in a separate text file, which is applied to the module when the site is assembled. These changes are easily accessed, they're easily reviewed, they're obvious. Because they're in a separate text file that's sitting there saying, hey, I'm a list of changes. This tiny methodology difference actually means a really huge amount in practice. A module that's been hacked is very difficult to use in the long term. The changes made to it are often not recorded at all anywhere, or they're recorded somewhere nobody's ever going to look again. Let's face it, once the project is launched, that wiki page you put up with the list of all the things you changed, it's invisible, it's gone. No one is ever going to look there. So these changes are essentially lost forever. Now, if someone comes along and updates that module that you've made changes to, your changes are gone, they're erased, and now the bug that you fixed, or the feature that you added, doesn't work anymore. It's poof, gone, goodbye. So when should I patch? Well, here's a good set of reasons. Number one, you found a module that does most of what you need, not quite everything. Or you found a bug in the module. This is actually quite common. You don't, or you need to integrate custom functionality into that module, but it doesn't have the right API or the right hook functions or the right this or the right that. So it's almost, but you need to tweak something. Or you need a change right now, and the module maintainer's on vacation. Now, when should I not do this? Well, if the module provides hook and alter functions, or uh, event listeners in the new Drupal 8, uh, that will allow you to do what you need, then use them. Drupal alter is an incredibly powerful thing, and it's in a lot of places in existing modules. So if that function is there, 
and it gives you the ability to access what you need to change, use that instead. If the module only really does a little of what you need and a whole bunch of stuff you don't need, you may be better off writing a custom module or finding a different contributive module that'll do what you actually need to do. There's no sense in patching 80% of a module and because you need this much of it. Or the dev version of the module has what you need or there's a patch already in the issue queue that will allow you to do what you want to do. At that point, we'll lead us to the next section. How do we do it? Well, step one in anything, in software most of all, is work smarter. This is a community. It's quite possible that somebody out there in the gigantic Drupal world has the same need as what you do and has already done what you need to do. Check first. Save yourself some work. It is well worth an hour of your time researching changes to this module that may have already been made rather than spending 10 hours writing a change only to find out a year from now that somebody did that and you wasted your time. If you're not already using the dev version of the module, try it. Um, you know, there's kind of a stigma about using dev modules in production. This is Drupal, and most modules are in dev forever and ever and ever. Odds are you're going to wind up using devs, dev modules, dev version modules in production. There are ways you can mitigate the risk with that. We can talk about that later. Um, but the bottom line is you're probably going to wind up doing it at some point. So suck it up and try it. Um, if that doesn't work, the links that are highlighted on this module page lead to the issue queue, where you can find other people's bug reports, other people's feature requests, support requests, and best of all, patches that have been written for those modules. So go in there, look around, and see if somebody else has said, well, I need it to do this, and you're like, hey, I need it to do that. And then you look, and they've already written the code to make it do that. Great. If you find a pit patch that looks promising, you skip like half this presentation right to the end where we talk about applying a patch. All right, no luck. We've looked through the issue queue. Maybe somebody else has reported that same bug. Nobody's fixed it. Now we go to the next phase, edit and patch. Step two, check out the module. You need to be working from a Git repo in order to make a patch. Technically, that's not entirely true. The easy way to do it is check the module out from the repo and work with it that way. Just downloading it is much more difficult. So find and click the link on the modules page that says version control. That's this one right here. Make sure, click it, takes you to the second screen over there. Make sure that the version to work from form item says dash X at the end. That's the dev module. That's the dev version. Okay, if it says 1.0, 1.2, 2.3, that's not the dev version, which means you won't be using the latest, greatest, most current code. Then copy and paste that text line into your terminal, run it, and you'll have checked out the module. You will now have a directory. Oh, that's really loud. You'll have a directory filled with a module. Now you can, in fact, check this out into the site's all modules directory of your working site. So Git can handle nested repos, can handle uh, folders within folders. Go ahead and check it out into your working directory if you think that'll be easier. Step three, the hack. Now's your chance. The magic of source control means that you are not going to screw up everything beyond all recognition. You're not going to wind up with an unusable module. You can always rewind, throw out your changes, and start over. Wipe the slate clean and start over if you absolutely have to. It will also show you the changes you've made so you can look at it and say, oh, well, there's the problem. Uh, debugging in that case can actually be much easier. Then enable the module and test it. Repeat it until it works the way you want it to. And the good news is the kittens are safe because you're doing this the right way. Now, two things to remember. Number one, please, 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 
make sure you are working against the dev version of the module. When you are cutting new code for a module, you want to be working against the latest and the greatest because there could be something that affects what you're working on. If you're working on adding a new database field and somebody else has already added a different new database field and it's in the dev version but it's not in the production version, you're going to run into a conflict. There's going to be problems when you try and integrate your code with a later version down the road. Work against the dev version, save yourself some trouble. When you get to around to contributing it to the issue queue, which we will cover in a minute, the first thing, if you don't work against the dev version, I guarantee the first thing you will be asked is re-roll your patch against the dev version, please. Absolutely 100% guaranteed. Second, please, and, and this applies to all of your coding, but if you're working on someone else's module, don't introduce security holes. Follow the best practices in Drupal. Use form API, use database abstraction, sanitize your texts. All of the good things we know how to do, we always do, we should follow the rules, okay? especially when you're working on someone else's module. The last thing you want to do is introduce a security hole to something that isn't yours. Okay? There's lots of good reading. I'm not going to go into security and patches. There's lots of good reading on that topic, and I encourage you to explore it. Step four is make the patch. Now, there's two ways to do this. The command line way, in the directory, git diff caret patch file name. Okay, this is actually really simple. This will create a file, in this case called patch underscore demo dot patch, that contains all the changes that you've made to your files, to all of the files in that module directory. Now, there's command line options that only include certain files to compare different directories, so on and so forth. Personally, I favor a different way. Source tree. This is a GUI interface for the management of your repositories, and it's awesome. It's also free. It's made by Atlassian, the same company that makes Jira, which is ticket management, Confluence, which is a wiki, and Bitbucket, which is a repository very much like GitHub. Um, we at Phase 2 use all three of those things uh, extensively. We are really kind of big fanboys of Atlassian. It's sort of shameful. Uh, it is reliable, regularly updated, easy to use, and it's free. Did I mention it's free? It's a really, really good product. It lists the files you've changes that you have changed. It shows you line by line the changes to the files. Green is stuff I've added. Pink is stuff I've taken away. If there's a pink line and a green line together, it means I changed one of those lines. Now you can see, especially here in the bottom, this looks very much like the patch file we saw earlier. Well, there's a reason. It also allows you to create a patch just like that. The best part of creating a patch in source tree is it will ask you which files to include. Pops up a nice little menu, whole list of checkboxes, boom. If you've made changes to five files, but you really only need to do changes to three, you can do only changes to three. Uh, this is so much better than trying to figure out how to specify all of this on the, on the command line. And in the end, Source tree is so completely compatible with Git that if you go back to the command line, everything that you've done in Source tree is reflected in the repository on the command line. So they are perfectly integrated. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. It's free. I suggest you use it. All right. Step five, submit your work. So we've rolled a patch. We found a bug in a module, or we found a necessary change in a module. We've checked the module out. We've edited the module and it didn't explode. We followed security practices. We've, it now does the thing we need it to do or it doesn't do the thing we need it not to do. What do we do with it now? Well, part of the Drupal community is we're a community. We work together. So go back to the issue queue. You should already be familiar with this from searching through it. Click create a new issue right there. This will pop up a form. It looks just like a Drupal administration form. Uh, fill it all out. Make the title descriptive. That's the important part. You want the title to say in 10 words or less what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And the summary should be a good explanation of what it is, what you've tried, how it works. If it's a bug, what you need to recreate it, particularly interacting with other modules. 
so on and so forth. Tell the maintainer of the module what you need in order to recreate the problem or what you want it to do. Don't attach your file just yet. We're not attaching it just yet because Drupal has, the Drupal community, has created a standard for naming files, uh, naming patch files. This is the standard. Now it looks a little complex. We'll walk through the steps of how you get all of this information. So the standard is module name dash short description of what your patch does dash issue queue number dash comment number dot patch. Okay. Module name and short description are fairly self-explanatory. Let me show you where to find the numbers. So when you create an issue queue, uh, a, a item in the issue queue, you are creating a node on Drupal.org. Uh, as you know, nodes have NIDs. So the issue number is actually the NID of the issue that you created in the issue queue for that module. It's right there in the URL, should know how to find it. Now, in order to add a patch to the issue node, we attach it to a comment. So your comment number will be one more than the highest number of comments that are already on the, on the node. If there aren't any, it will be number one. It is not the comment ID. The comment ID is a very long number in the URL. Don't use that. It is the actual visual display number right there. Use this plus one. now you have the numbers. You can rename the patch. Uh, in our example here, the patch file that we are creating is for the patch demo module. We are adding a job field to the database. It is issue queue number 20560001, and there were two comments already on the issue queue node. So our patch will attach to comment number three, dot patch. So we rename the file. Do this in the Finder if you're on Mac OS X or whatever the Windows equivalent is. Make a comment on the issue queue node. Usually it's something like, hey, I did it. Patch is attached. Please review. And upload it. Congratulations. You are now a contributing member of the Drupal community. This is a huge deal, guys. Okay? Think of all the kittens that you have saved by doing this the right way. Step six, bringing your work together, okay? This is where we put all the pieces that we have uh, all together in the same place. Now, we started off, get conversational here for a minute. We started off with a problem. So we had a website, we built it on dev, or we've had it in production, and it caused us a problem. Now the problem could be a client came to us and said, hey, this is great, but I wanted to do this other thing too. Or the problem could be, hey, when I do this and this and this weird thing that nobody's ever done, it goes kaput. So we had a problem to solve. Now there's two ways we can do it. We can hack and hack and hack until it works, or we make a patch. We've made a patch. So we've edited, checked out the file, checked out the module, made our changes, uh, compared them against the existing code with a tool called git diff. Uh, which is what source tree runs on the background, by the way, when it makes a patch. It's created a file for us that lists out very, very succinctly all the changes we've made. We've sent that back to the module maintainer, and it's now existing on drupal.org for our reference. But what do we do with it? Because so far, we haven't actually launched that change. It's just sitting on our dev server, or it's sitting in a text file on our, on our local laptop. Well, here's what we do bring all the pieces together. This is a Drush Make file. Now if you don't know Drush Make, I'm not going to go into all the details of the incredible amount of things that Drush can do, but it is well worth the time that you will spend becoming familiar with it. If you don't know it, go learn it, because it's one of the most powerful back-end tools that you can possibly imagine, and it's not hard to use. Now a lot of us are afraid of the command line. And Drush, make is, Drush and Drush make are command line tools. The command line is in that, that scary terminal. It's the black with the white text. It's kind of creepy and freaky. It's not. It just takes a very specific set of requirements. So it is worth the time to spend 
to learn it. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of all the incredible amount of things that it can do here, but I'm going to talk about Drush Make. So the history of Drush Make, essentially what happened is somebody said, hey, Drush is a great tool. Wouldn't it be great if, in addition to all these other cool things it can do, it could take a list of stuff that we specify in a file and assemble a website out of that stuff? And so they hacked on it and they hacked on it, and this is what they have. Now, this is a Drush Make file. It's a very simple one. Um, but it makes site building work the way it really should. Now, in combination with other tools, it also allows us to avoid committing changes. It allows us to avoid committing entire modules and the whole of Drupal core into our own repository. We commit this file, and then we run that file, and it assembles the website for us along with our, with our custom code, okay? So let's take a closer look here. It also, and this is a keynote for us here today, it allows us to specify patches that we apply to modules. So not only does it assemble a website for us based on a list of stuff that we're gonna download, it also downloads patches, applies them for us, and then gives us the end result. This is incredibly powerful because it means we don't have to go through the git diff and git apply process manually every time we assemble our website. Okay, so running Drush Make on this file will download Drupal. You can see that up at the top, Drupal core, projects, Drupal type core, version 7.30. That is a little out of date now. I suggest you make sure you're downloading the latest version, but this slide's a little old. Uh, it puts all of the projects and libraries in the contrib subdirectory with insights slash all slash modules. So all the stuff you're downloading. It downloads the features module. You can see right there under contrib, which is underlined in red because my text editor seems, thinks it's misspelled. Uh, so it downloads the feature module, our patch demo module. It chooses a specific URL, a specific type, git, picks the dev branch, that's the line right above the orange where it says 7.x-1.x. You could, in fact, specify 1.0, 2.3, 7.4, if they've gotten that many versions. I don't think anybody's up that far. And then in the orange is the patch that we are applying. Now, this number, am I going to run out of cord? How far can I go? Woo! This number right here, you'll note, is also the issue queue number. It's the same NID as we've used before. It's also right here in the file name. So that is a patch. It will download that patch. It will apply it to the module after it's been assembled. It will report whether or not it worked. And it will assemble the entire site together. That's all there is to it. Once we've run this, drush make and then the file name, and then I think you can specify a folder to put it all in. It downloads core. It downloads the features directory, the features module. Downloads patch demo module. Downloads our patch. Applies the patch to patch demo module. Puts it all together. And hands you a directory. And says, here you go, website. And that's the point at which you can run install.php. Now, if you've already built your website, and this is a reiteration of it, because, for example, core has gone up a version and you're updating, then it builds with the new version and you apply it over the folder that's already there and you have a new, a new website. Now, there are spe there's a couple of caveats to that. You don't want to overwrite your settings file, so make sure you move that around and all that. But you, you guys can figure that out. But we didn't have to manually change anything. We didn't go into a repository full of somebody else's code, such as Drupal core, make changes to it, and then put it up on our web server. See, because the whole philosophy here is that your repository should only ever contain your code. Shouldn't contain Drupal core, shouldn't contain Bob down the streets modules, should only contain the custom stuff you've written for your site, your theme, your CSS, your modules and your make file. Now, 
you're working with someone else's code. You're working with someone else's module. That's kind of the definition of working in the contrib space. When you put an issue queue, when you put a node in the issue queue out there, when you put an issue out there and you say, hey, this is broken, I tried to fix it, here's my fix. Well, you're handing someone else your work and they may or may not like it. They may or may not code the way you do. They may or may not think that it's a safe patch. So there's one of three possible responses. The first response, best case scenario, hey, that worked, thanks, ka -chunk. Now it's rolled in and it's in the new dev version. Cool, that's a great feeling. The first time it happens to you, you suddenly feel like you've, like you've gone up a level. You, uh, you, you, you're now a real developer. Second, yeah, no, that doesn't fit with my, with my vision for this module. Thanks, closed, goodbye. Okay, that sucks. But here's the best part. Drupal.org doesn't ever delete anything. So that file is still on Drupal.org slash files, meaning you can still use it in your make file. Just because somebody else didn't like it doesn't mean you can't still use it. I have put up many, 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 many patches that I knew would not get approved because I needed it to work this way. And that's the end of the story, right? Because somebody was paying me to make it work that way. Oh, well. Now, if they come to you and they say, that's great, but you just introduced a huge security hole that my neighbor down the street could use to take over your website, okay, don't use that patch. But if it's just a philosophy thing or if it's just a, yeah, that takes things in a direction I really wasn't going, nobody cares. You can still use it. There's, there's a third response. And this is where the community part comes in. And that's the discussion. You, they can say, that's a great idea. Maybe it would work better if we did this. And then somebody else comes in and says, well, yeah, I like that, but you know, the standard is this way. And, you know, seven issues later, somebody else submits a patch and maybe it's a little better than yours. Maybe it works a little differently, but it does the same thing. Okay, well, great. Change your make file. Done. Now, that process can drag on and on and on and on and on and on and on. There are issues in the issue queue that are literally tens of pages long that are six and eight years old or more. If you get into core development, you will find those issues and nobody has ever been able to solve the problem to the satisfaction of everybody involved. This is where we go back to this part, the outlined in orange part. You find one you like and you use it. Sometimes it's an interim solution. Sometimes it's not the best solution, but it's your solution and it works. Don't be afraid of that. Okay. Oops, too far. Now, here's the other question. Why bother? Why would we go to all this trouble? Because there's a lot of extra steps there compared to cowboy coding, where you hack the module on your site and you throw it up on your server and you're done. Okay, R show of hands, who here has done that? Uh-huh, we've all done it. Some of us just don't want to admit it. Okay, I get that, I do. And if you're a one-person shop and you're working on your grandma's website for her knitting projects, just do it. Nobody's gonna care, right? I will admit, my personal website, not the phase two site, my personal site, probably has a couple of hacks on it. Well, the reason we do it is because of the community. The reason we do it is because of the other developers. There's a saying which says, code as if the next person who gets your code is going to be very, very angry. Because they will when they see the bad things you've done with it. And it will probably be you. I can't tell you how many times I've come back to something six months later and gone, what? What was I thinking? 
What did I do? Why did I do this? This doesn't make any sense. Code as if someone else has to inherit your work because that's what happens. That's why we do patches, okay? Because after you've applied the patch, it looks exactly the same as if you cowboy coded it. But the patch allows us accountability. Accountability is huge when it comes to working inside a team. Okay? Well, okay, that's great. But DrushMake can download a patch from anywhere that's publicly accessible on the web. You can put it on your company's file server. You can put it on your personal website in a download directory that nobody ever looks on. So why go through the issue queue and start the argument? Well, because each of us, no matter how inexperienced, no matter how new, no matter how totally ninja badass, can contribute and help make this community and our product stronger. Communities work best when everyone contributes. You know this is true. You look at a community that's got six, how many of you, okay, another show of hands. Sixth grade, group project. How many of you were that one guy that carried everybody else on your team? Uh-huh. Okay, how many of you were somebody else on the team? Uh-huh. Don't be that guy. That's why we contribute. They work better when communities work better when everybody's pulling their weight. Okay? Now your patch may not be accepted. Or it may. Or it may lead to a discussion that completely revolutionizes how we do Drupal. Okay? You get into the core issue queues. You start talking to the guys who made the decision to move to Symphony. They revolutionized how we do Drupal. Okay? So you could spark a discussion that leads to something entirely new and entirely cool. Even if it isn't in, even if it's never accepted, it's still in the issue queue. Even if the, the thread is completely ignored, nobody ever does anything with it, it's not closed, the bot comes by two weeks later and closes it for lack of activity, and the, the maintainer ignores it entirely and nobody ever comments on it, it's still on the file server. So you can still use it. On a more personal note, contributing in the issue queues helps you get known in the Drupal community. This is fantastic for your career, okay? Many times, I have heard many, many stories of HR director getting in a resume of someone they've never heard of, passes it off to the CTO who looks up the person and goes, oh, I know that dude. He's contributed 18 patches to my module that I maintain. He's a rock star. Hire him now before somebody else does. Okay, I, I can name people at phase two that have done that. So, it's great for your career, it's great for the community, it's great for Drupal, the product, there's no downside. And the truth of it is, it doesn't take that much longer, especially with a tool like SourceTree and DrushMake. All right, some very important links. Top one, Drupal Patch Contributor Guide. This is the quote unquote, official community guide to basically everything we've talked about. Second one, a blog post from 2008, which is still incredibly ap applicable as to why we don't hack core and contrib, pretty much covers the first part of this session. Uh, I drew a lot from it. So Joshua Brower, if you're here, thank you. If you're not, thank you. The actual documentation for git diff, a link for source tree, uh, a blog post, which covers pretty much all of this uh, on the phase two blog. And finally, session feedback is at events.drupal.org slash node slash 775, which will re-resolve to the, uh, the name of this session. So please leave session feedback. Um, if you liked it, if you didn't, please leave session feedback uh, so we can all get better. Again, contributing, being a community. Again, I am Joshua Turton. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm with phase two. You can reach me at that email or that Twitter handle or at our booth in the exhibitor hall. So please do leave session feedback. You'll also be able to download the slides there, um, which will, again, also link to the blog post, I think. And I th think they will also put the recording up. If you would like a demo of this process, if you would like to walk through this in real time with me, find me at our booth. We can hook up an informal demo. I'm already prepped for it. I've got a demo module in my sandbox. We can go right through these steps. I would be happy to do that for you. 
Last thing, plug for Drupal Camp Costa Rica. It's happening in San Jose. I'm on the organizing committee. It is awesome. Costa Rica is very cool. Uh, if you are interested in speaking, session submissions will be open soon, or you can contact me directly. Sponsorship opportunities will be available. Talk to me for more info and come join us. It's a good, good time. And you're in Costa Rica. All right, uh, we have time for questions. So there's a microphone back there. Uh, why don't you come to the mic so that it's on the recording. First, can you pull the links back, the slide with the links back up so we can continue typing? Thanks. And um, do you know how to manually apply a patch without using Dorfman? Or can you illustrate? Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing that. The first one is basically on the command line. It's kind of the inverse of the git diff. I forget the exact Drush, or uh, the exact git command, but I think it's like git apply and then the file name. You have to be in the right directory. Uh, source tree can also apply a patch directly, uh, which is how I usually do it if I'm manually doing it. So either of those two options will work. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Very good question. So if you didn't hear it, the question was what happens with the module when you, or what happens with the patch when you upgrade the module? And basically it's one of two things. Either it will continue to apply or it will go completely. Um, so that's the short answer. The longer answer is Git is very, very smart about how it applies patches. So it will, when you look at a patch file, and I'm going to scroll back to the patch file really quick at the very beginning and I'll come back to the links. You can see it has line numbers. There are a few lines above the orange, 125 comma 7 plus 125. So that tells Git where to look. But Git is very, very smart. So it kind of uses some fuzzy logic and tries to find the lines that you're changing. Now you'll notice around the orange box there are a few lines of code that aren't changed. That helps it find it. So if you upgrade a module and some code has moved around but it hasn't changed, then your patch will still apply. And it will report, oh, it was offset by seven lines. Now, if you have a module that changes the lines of code that you are trying to patch, it's going to report a failure. And then it's on you to fix it again. Um, the good news is DrushMake is smart enough to exit when that happens and say, dude, it broke. And then you get to go fix it. Um, now, this will absolutely happen when your patch gets accepted to the dev version. So module maintainer comes along and says, hey, that's awesome. Let's put it in. And it puts it in. Well, now somebody's changed the lines you're trying to change and Git gets confused and can't sort it out. So that will absolutely happen in your best case scenario. That's a good thing for you. So then you go to your make file and you take out the patch, the line that specifies the patch, and you say, okay, use this dev version. Golden. So yeah, it will break. That does happen. It's kind of on you to fix it. But the good news is that you have the patch file that tells you what changes needed to be made and why. You have the issue queue number where you can go research what happened, because the issue queue number, remember, is in the Drush Make file and on the file name. So you go research why did they make this change, and you can re-roll the patch against the new version. And it's much easier than if you had to go through the whole process all over again. So that's, again, why we use the issue queue. That's why we use the patch files. That's why we put the issue queue number in the patch file name so that we can find all of that information again. Um, yeah, so that, that should answer the question, I think. Next. Um, and 
say a year down the line we want to use that patch. However, the community has come in and sort of changed the intention for that patch, and it's not quite applicable to your case anymore. What do you do? You fix it. I mean, that's the bottom line is this process gets you so much further, but eventually as things continue to evolve, it will break down. And as developers, it's on us to either redirect, re-roll the patch that we've had, the code that we're trying to change, or accept the new direction and work around it, work within that. So eventually, yeah, eventually all patches will break because code is an evolving thing. Drupal is an evolving thing. This allows us to continue to work within it. Now, if you want to, there are ways within Drush Make to pin to a specific commit. So you can feed it the commit hashtag, and you can look up how to do that in Drush Make, but you can say, okay, I want the dev version on this date, at this time, on this commit. And so you're using that exact thing that you know your patch applies to and nothing past it. So no matter how far it goes, how many years into the future, you will continue to use that one little bit of code as it was on that day at that time. Now, there are pros and cons to this. If you commit or you pin to that one commit and six weeks later somebody finds a security hole in that module, patches it, fixes it, new dev version, uh-oh, you're still back over here. So there's pros and cons, and you need to monitor that. Drupal itself has very good monitoring of updates of modules, for particularly for security releases, very good notification. If you are not on at least one of your servers using the, I think it's the update module that tells you these things, turn it on um, because you need to be aware of those things. So I think that should, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. So I guess like everyone else, I have more of a question about Drush Bake, I guess. Than, than about <laughs> it's a that. wonderful tool. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so um, the, I really like your philosophy of using the make file. Uh, we're starting to head in that direction, but we have a lot of sort of inertia of having the whole core plus contrib plus custom committed completely in our, in our repo. Um, is there a way to have like a Drush make file that just includes the patches and somehow automatically apply them after you run Drush up? Or is that like witchcraft? I can see by your face that it's witchcraft. Uh, the thing with Drush make is that it expects to assemble a website for you. So, I suppose you could, I'm not sure if it would work, you could skip the line where you're telling it to download core, at which point it would assemble really only the contribs directory, and then apply it. I think what you're asking is beyond the scope of what Drush Make can do, that if you really need to go that direction, you'd be better off looking at some sort of a bash script that is run by Jenkins. Um, Jenkins is a continuous integration tool way beyond the scope of this talk, um, largely because I don't understand it entirely. Um, we, we have people who are really good at that. Um, if you want to talk Jenkins, come to the booth. We will set you up. Um, but it's a, basically a tool that automatically runs a bunch of stuff. When we, at phase two, when we use Drush Make, it's wrapped in a script that Jenkins runs for us. Um, and on our dev sites, uh, when we make it, it, it monitors the repo. And so when we make and commit a change to the dev uh, branch, so pull requests and all of that, when changes happen in the repository, it rebuilds the site automatically for us. So what you're asking is more likely to be handled by a custom Jenkins script that looks at your repo and then slaps a bunch of stuff on it. But honestly, if you're committing contrib modules to your repo, you may as well just patch them and put them in there. And then save the patch file in a list of you know, in a directory of these are applied to this. Right, well that's actually exactly the sort of thing that I'm trying to advance from. Is we yes, it, it, is, is, it is a big, yeah, it is a big intellectual leap uh, to, to make the jump to only contribute, only committing your, your, your code. There is, 
there's an insecurity feeling there that has to be dealt with. It's, it's honestly, it's more of an emotional thing than anything else in my experience. It's the devs have to come to terms with the idea that not everything is there and they can't just put their hands on it. Um, so yeah, there are ways to do what you're asking. Drush make is probably not that way. Okay, thank you. I, I noticed when I'm looking through an issue queue and reviewing a patch for an issue that I don't have the same problem with, um, a lot of times they'll run it up against the patch and then there's a path to fail. Can you kind of sum up what it is? Oh, yes, I totally should. Um, when you submit a patch to an issue queue node, as a comment, you, you attach the patch file to the, to the issue queue, you set the issue status, it's one of the fields on the form, set the issue status to needs review. That will trigger a bot that runs on drupal.org to come by, attempt to apply your patch to the dev version of the code, again this is why we use dev, it's another reason, it will attempt to apply that patch and report whether or not it worked. Now very frequently, it won't. Um, for reasons of syntax or very detailed, you know, this or that. Um, if you're in a situation where you've applied more than one patch to a module and so the code lines are all different, it'll just go, Woo, what, no. And um, so there's any number of reasons why that wouldn't work. Uh, Generally speaking, if you're looking through an issue queue and you see a report of a patch that failed, unless there's a whole lot of comments saying, yeah, the bot failed this for some stupid reason, but it works for me, don't use it. That's generally an indication that it's, that it's not going to apply very well. Are you on? Yeah. Oh well. Uh, I will have the slides up, so if you want those links, which I'm trying to get to the slide anyway, uh, if you want the links, then you can find them on the website. So, yeah, so that's basically pass and fail in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Is there a way to uh, automatically create a new file from an existing site? Because it looks like a lot of writing to, to create that new file. I believe there is. Um, I forget what it is, but I'm pretty sure that it might even be a command that you can issue to Drush Make that says, look at this and try and assemble something. Uh, there are also a few online tools that I have seen that allow you to fill out a form where you specify the, the Drupal version and you specify the, you know, the contrib modules that you want from a list of a bunch of really common contrib modules and, you know, possibly a few libraries and it'll spit out a good starter. Um, so either one of those things, I'm fairly certain there is a command line tool that will analyze a directory and uh, try and spit out a Drush make file. Uh, I would use that with some caution. But yeah, the tools for that do exist. I think so, yeah. It, that's something that would probably be answered by a fairly easy Google search. I have time for a f couple more questions if there are. There's usually a lot of questions on this session, which is why it's kind of short. How would your uh, suggested workflow be modified if a person worked in an environment, a corporate environment, where in order to be able to release any code, I'd have to get permission from my legal department? In other words, I can't contribute things back because my policy at work prevents that. Is there some way to do this thing where if you're saying you could host a file locally or something like that? Yes. Um, there's a couple of solutions to that. You can put it on, if you're working in a essentially contained, closed environment where, a, a greedy environment. Yeah. right. Um, as long as Drush Make can see the file, can follow the file path to that, um, then it can apply the patch. So you don't have to put it in the issue queue. You can just host it on your server um, internally. As long as Drush Make 
has access to that file path, to that, to that URL path. I believe it is also possible now for DrushMake to take a local file path for those. So you could, in fact, host it on the same server and possibly even put it in your repo. Um, I recall that being kind of complicated. I haven't tried that in a while, but I think it's possible. So you could, in fact, patch the module um, that way. That, in my opinion, now we get kind of back to that question of, well, why don't you just at that point hack the module? I think you're still better off with the patch file methodology because of the accountability and the future proofing. Um, so I, I still suggest that you go through that, met, you know, go through most of this process without the submission to the issue queue. Um, I'm fairly certain that it is possible now to locally host those kind of files. I know you can do it with libraries, and I know that you can do it with uh, some other things that that DrushMake deals with. Um, I haven't tried it with a patch in a really long time, but I'm pretty sure you can do it. So that that's probably the solution that you would want to look for. Projector is still not on. Hello. Did I kick it? <laughs> All right. <laughs>